Today, I'm going to present uh, you uh, a modern interpretation of a particular verse in Surat Anbiya, uh, a verse that uh, speaks about the inheritors of the uh, earth. Uh, the inheritance issue has always been an issue, particularly among the Shiite circles, because of their uh, messianic expectations, their uh, further uh, stress they put on messianic expectations, particularly at the ends of the times, uh, but also uh, among Naqshbandi circles within Sunni Islam. Uh, I'm going to read passages from several different books of Muhammad Fatullah Gülen on the attributes of the inheritors of the earth. The first passage is going to explain the link between the topic uh, of the presentation and uh, the verse in Surat Anbiya on uh, inheritance. Uh, but let me say... Um, this, this particular uh, title uh, was produced back in 1993 when uh, Fethullah Gülen Hocaefendi was writing um, chief columns at uh, a theology journal called Yeni Ümit in Turkish at that time, the New Hope or New Expectations, uh, particularly on uh, the situation of the Muslim world, solutions of the problems uh, of uh, not only the Muslim world, of the humanity as a, uh, in total. Uh, and uh, this issue of inheritors of the earth and the, the attributes of or qualifications of uh, the inheritors of the earth was raised uh, in late 1993 and it continued for about two years uh, publishing uh, chief columns uh, on this topic. Uh, I have selected uh, phrases or passages um, from 50 years of writings and preachings of Fethullah Gülen Hoca Efendi because this issue was already there back in 1970s, early 1970s when Hoca Efendi was preaching in minor small um, cities of Turkey uh, at that time, he was using the label golden generation or the savior generation for uh, the same uh, meaning, uh, the inheritors of the earth. Uh, once again, in 1980s, late 1980s, when he started to preach on Sundays on major mosques of uh, cities like Istanbul and Izmir and so on, uh, he started a series of Sunday's uh, uh, preachings uh, named uh, the uh, attributes of perfection of humanity. And once again, he dealt with, by and large, 12 major attributes that he attributed to the golden generation or the savior generation and so on. Well, the inheritors of the earth or the golden generation or the promised generations or the savior generation or the generation of revival, whichever you prefer, refers to the same hope of humanity. And this is not unique to Islam. Uh, this, this, this appears in the writings of uh, Plato as, as early as Plato as uh, as a utopia of uh, a city of, called Atlantis, where people actually lived a perfect life in perfect harmony and so on. And uh, that utopian uh, search for a perfect society continued on uh, during the uh, European Renaissance with names, names like Campanella uh, and Francis Bacon, and as early as late as the 21st century, we still see Western intellectuals writing books about a perfect society and the attributes of the people who are going to build that perfect society. So that is a universal search uh, for, uh, for, for a perfected society and the attributes of the people who are going to build that society. Fethullah Gülen Hoca Efendi dealt with uh, several of these attributes. 
uh, but uh, I managed to bring them down to 12. Uh, righteousness uh, in the list being a kind of framework uh, attribute, and the other 11 of them are actually uh, uh, perfecting the attribute of righteousness. The term righteousness is, of course, uh, passes in the Quran, uh, when in Surah Anbiya, uh, Allah Jalla Jalalu says, uh, we have written uh, in Zikr uh, and also in uh, Zabur uh, that uh, this earth will be inherited by my righteous servants. And throughout the history of Islam, people discussed what does it mean to be righteous? And if this is a promise by our Lord, that the world or the earth or whatever the term earth is referring to, whether it is a particular land, piece of land, like the Holy Land, as the Jews and Christians would claim, uh, or the whole world, or the whole universe, as the Tullah Gülen Hujafendi is going to interpret the term. Uh, we know that uh, there had been eras in the history, and in fact, we are still passing through such an era, that the righteous servants of our Lord, uh, quote unquote, the Muslims, are not actually inheritors of the earth. They are not. They do not have any dominion on the earth, and so on. We are, uh, by and large, uh, in the sidelines of history in the last three hundred years. There had been times when the Ottomans, for example, or the Ilkhanids in the past. Uh, or major powers of the, uh, the, the the Muslim world had been dominant over the rest of the uh, rest of the earth, but this is not the case for the last, say, 300 years. If we were to speak about science and technology, we would even be able to say five to eight hundred years. The superiority has already passed to the West. So the question mark is. If this has been this has been promised to us, why on earth the promise is not realized? What is the problem? Of course, we never would come out and say the problem is in the promise, Hasha. The problem is in our righteousness. If we were truly righteous, then our Lord Allah Jalla Jalalu would keep His promise, but we couldn't keep our promise. Then, then the question mark. Uh, moves on, what is righteousness? What kind of a righteousness our Lord is uh, has ordained on us as a precondition of the inheritance of the earth? Whatever that inheritance means. So I'm going to read passages, but I have to warn you, this presentation was prepared um, as a part of a 12-week long uh, training at Respect Graduate School uh, in United States, where I am teaching. In this summer, uh, I taught about uh, 250 students from all around the world uh, in Turkish on the attributes of the inheritors of the earth. So this was a lengthy uh, reading. We have read uh, sources from the East and the West, to, uh, to from the Muslim uh, tradition, but also from philosophical traditions uh, of all uh, cultures. So uh, my presentation will not be able to finalize in one hour. I'm not going to read everything on the screen. I suggest you to, but I'm going to just, you know, move on uh, the topics. I'm going to deal with uh, the idea of righteousness. I'm going to deal with the first um, uh, attribute as perfect faith, uh, al-Iman al-Kamil, and then continue on love and universal uh, metaphysics, then uh, turning to science with the trio of uh, logic, uh, reason, and, uh, and, and consciousness, uh, then uh, to self-criticism, critical thinking, and revising our axioma, axioms or um, uh, or uh, our understanding of the relationship between the universe, the man, and the life. 
as the fifth uh, attribute. Then I'm going to speak about freedom of thought and free thinking, which has two different meanings. I'm going to speak about consultation and collective uh, consciousness on mathematical thinking, on aesthetics, on an Islamic aesthetics, and uh, mutual uh, accord of action and thought, uh, national uh, soul and uh, culture, a love for uh, a, a man's uh, own nation, and uh, at last uh, the marriage or balance between heart, heart and mind. You, you already understand that each one of those presentations will take about an hour, so this is only an introductory uh, lecture in order to help you to realize the uh, greatness of the topic. If anybody among you is uh, desires to continue on reading and discussing on this issue, well, I'm going to actually organize an English language course of uh, 14 weeks long next summer. Again, uh, in respect to graduate school, I, I suggest you to join uh, the school uh, to become one of the discussants. Now, let me continue on with righteousness. The passage, as I said, is from 1993, from uh, the uh, Yeni Umid magazine, the New Hope magazine, uh, and the, the, the article was named uh, The Inheritors of the Earth. Uh, I'm going to read only a few parts of the uh, article. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Indeed, we wrote in the Psalms after the message, probably Torah, that my servants, the righteous, shall inherit the earth. NBA 105. Hoj Efendi says, without doubt, that promise guaranteed in this verse by an oath will be fulfilled one day, nor without doubt is it the inheritance of the earth only, for inheriting the earth also means governing and managing the resources of the sky and space. It will be almost a universal dominion. As this dominion is one that will be deputed by a, to a regent or steward, on behalf of the Lord, it is extremely important, indeed essential, that the attributes that are appropriate to inheriting the earth and the heavens are conformed to. Indeed, only so far as the required attributes are realized and practiced, can the dream come true. Now, there are three issues here that O.J. Fendi is underlining as a part of his uh, interpretation of the particular verse in the Quran, the verse of inheritance. First of all, he says, there is an oath here. Verily, indeed, our Lord is not only promising, but also uh, guaranteeing with an oath that he is going to give the inheritance of the earth to his righteous servants. The second issue, so we, we cannot have any doubt about this. This means that if something is going to be questioned about the current situation of the earth, the political situation or economic or technological situation, it is not the promise. It's not hush our Lord. We have to question our own selves. And that is actually the third uh, observation. What Japan says, well, if you are going to question anything, you question your righteousness. If you are truly righteous, our Lord will keep his promise. And in between the two, which if and also underlines, what does it mean to inherit the earth? To inherit the earth is not necessarily the uh, a political dominion over the earth or any part of the world. It is a kind of dominion uh, that is promised to, to mankind on the earth, on the universe. When Sayyidina Adam was uh, created, our Lord, in Surat Baqarah we read, uh, told the angels that he is going to create a vicegerent, a steward, on the earth. It's going to be some kind of a, 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 
of a, a steward of our Lord on the earth. That is the dominion that Hodge Effendi is referring to. The dominion means to control the knowledge uh, and managing of the resources of the earth and of the whole space. Now, that is promised to the righteous servants of our Lord. And Hoja Fendi says, then we have to attain those attributes that are going to make us truly righteous. Then the term righteous becomes critical to understand. And Hoja Fendi continues on, what does it mean to be righteous? He says, the inheritance is for those of his servants who are righteous in thought and religion, not only in religion, but also in thought and religion, for those who have a Muhammadan spirit and Quranic morality, this is something we expect, good Muslims, who foster and retain the idea of unity, accord, togetherness, and solidarity, and these refer to uh, a society a strongly knit society, which is not necessarily Islamic, but certainly a brotherhood, who are aware of the era they are living in, who are well equipped with science and knowledge, who always keep and observe the balance between this world and the next. And we here we realize that the attributes are not only referring to the hereafter, they are not only referring to some kind of axiological, meaning ethical values or moral values, they are not referring to our daily practice of Islamic lifestyle, like praying five times a day and paying the uh, alms and so on. They are also referring to science, knowledge, and the, and, and the balance, a forging a balance between this world and the next. And that is the critical understanding of Hoja Effendi, which is supported by and large uh, the interpretation of the particular verse uh, by Muslim uh, commentators of the Quran throughout uh, Islamic history, that righteousness does not necessarily mean a religious righteousness. It, con it certainly contains it, but it also has a second dimension, worldly righteousness, this worldly righteousness. So uh, the term in the Quran is salih. So salahat means righteousness. So the salaha is, is not only dini, a salaha a dini, yeah? meaning the, re the, the religious righteousness, it's also dunyawi, a salaha a dunyawi, the worldly uh, righteousness, which incorporates science, knowledge, technology, a, a, a strongly knit society, rule of law, and so on. So at this stage, we do realize that righteousness has uh, two dimensions, like yin yang, uh, of the Chinese philosophy that complete each other. Without uh, a religious righteousness, being good Muslims, you cannot be righteous, yes, but we could, without being good people in this world and successful in sciences, successful in technology, in economy, in culture, in arts, and so on, you cannot be righteous in this world. So, the promise is not only made to good Muslims. There are good Muslims out there. You know, there have always been good Muslims out there, righteous by means of their religious ways of living, but it is not enough for the promise. It has to also incorporate the second side, the righteousness, this worldly righteousness. And that is the missing side uh, if we are going to question our own righteousnesses. In fact, Ojeb Fendi continues on, which is not uh, in front of you here uh, in this same uh, article and says, if Muslims fail to apprehend both elements of righteousness truly, then the inheritance of the earth is going to be give, given to other people who do not have full righteousness, but uh, comparatively they are in a better situation. And I have to admit, we all have to admit 
that uh, the West, at least for the last 150 years, has been uh, promising a, a, a stronger worldly righteousness. I'm not going to say religious righteousness, but certainly the worldly righteousness element is there. Let me move to other 11 attributes uh, that make up as a totality the, the, the righteousness. So righteousness is not only uh, a dual category of uh, religious righteousness and worldly righteousness, but it also has at least 11 subcategories, the first one being a perfect faith. Virgil van de Saints, the first attribute of the inheritors, of course, under the framework uh, attribute or quality of righteousness, is perfect faith. Without perfect faith in Islam, in, in, in Sayyidina Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Quran, in a monotheistic understanding of God and so on, you cannot be truly righteous. You can be truly righteous in its worldly meaning. You can be a good scientist. You can be uh, very successful in economy or in arts and so on, but it, it won't be a complete righteousness. And of course, your dominion or your control or your management or your uh, apprehension of the resources of the, the, the space and the earth is not going to be complete. Well, uh, it's obvious what uh, the, the, the perfect faith means by means of uh, a perfect belief, unshakable belief in God. But Roger Fendi continues on and says, well, perfect belief actually imposes on us two or three particular qualities. One is the epistemology of faith. Well, epistemology means philosophy of knowledge. So it says, if you truly believe in God, that this whole universe is created by Allah, not only in its totality, but also each and every single atom in this world, in this universe, has been and is being created and recreated by our Lord, then wherever you look at, you read, you read the signs of our Lord. And that means that both a, a reading of the Quran as the book of Sharia and the reading of the book of universe becomes a major, uh, a major target for a man of perfect faith. It also gives you a perfect courage and confidence in this world because you believe in God you actually lean on your God. You believe in a God that is capable of doing everything, anything, everywhere, anytime. This, of course, also underlines that we as Muslims should have always a hope and high expectations about the future of the Muslim nations of this world, not because of our current situation, but because of our Lord. He can. He always can. Of course, he has bound us to, to reasons uh, in, on this earth. So we have to uh, deal with the issue of causality and we have to work through his sunnatullah, his own manners of doing things, uh, and he is going to respond to, to our uh, general will, our attempts. But we have to have a courage. But it was Zaman Said Nursi said, a faith, a perfect faith, makes a, man, makes a man a real man. In fact, it makes a man a sultan over the world. Whoever attains perfect faith can actually challenge the whole world single-heartedly. That is the strength that is given to a man of perfect faith. I'm going to read also a short passage here because it also tells us that a person of belief also looks at the world 
looks at the world uh, in a kind of extreme interest in the universe. Not because everything around us is interesting, but because everything around us are created by our Lord. And when we look at the uh, nature, when we look at the uh, animal kingdom, the plantations and so on, the environment or the space, we, are, we get interest in them, not because they are interesting on its own, they are interesting, of course, but because we say our God does not create anything in vain. If Allah created these things, they have to be saying something to me. Of course, such a view converts any kind of scientific activity into a religious activity. That perfect faith is actually is the, is the bridge between the uh, righteousness in its religious meaning and the righteousness in its worldly meaning. If you are truly righteous and if you have perfect faith for you studying and working in a university, in a laboratory, is, is a religious activity, is a perfect religious activity because you are reading the book of universe, which is the book of God. I always say somebody who does uh, scientific studies on the inner organs of a frog can also say I am studying the beautiful names of God because here in the inner organs of the frog I see the uh, echo of the beatitude of uh, the beautiful names of my law. And of course, uh, any science, any scientific endeavor gets its value from the subject matter of that science. And with that perfect faith, the subject matter of uh, anatomy is no longer a body, flesh and bones. The subject matter of anatomy becomes God, the beautiful names of God. The subject matter of ge geography is no longer mountains and, and rivers and the seas and so on. It is the God. Subject matter of any science becomes our Lord. And they, are, they all attain a divine, a sanctified status. And by means of that, study of those sciences becomes a sanctified uh, endeavor also. That is what perfect faith uh, has to give us. Of course, when we learn this, we have to turn back and ask ourselves, are we doing this? Do we feel we are worshipping our Lord when we go to university, when we study, when we read a physics or astronomy book? Do we feel that we are worshipping? Well, Blaise Pascal, a major mathematician of the Renaissance era, did feel like that. He observed the universe and he said the creator of this universe it was certainly, is certainly a mathematician. He found his own profession in the universe and it was very dear to, it, to him. And he truly believed in one God. Or Sir James Jeans, uh, a major American uh, astrophysicist of early, early 20th century in Princeton University, did the same. He looked at the universe to the sky and, and cried, wept, seeing that some people do not believe in God. And he said, how can somebody deny existence of God when they watch the sky in the night, seeing these stars and galaxies and so on? And he believed studying astrophysics was actually studying God. Well, I'm giving examples from the West uh, because in the, in, in the East, particularly in the Muslim world, we usually take these things as given. It's not. So if we want both uh, elements of righteousness, our perfect faith should not be only about perfect uh, practicing of prayers daily, 
you know, perfect practicing of psalm and the fasting and uh, on almsgiving and so on. They have to it, they have to be there, but also it has to be uh, to to have elements of our relationship with the universe. What kind of a relationship we do, do we have with the environment? Muslim environmentalism is an obligation on us because this whole universe is an amana given to us. Right? It's given to us uh, to be secured, to be protected. It is given to us by our Lord. And that makes it valuable. Let me move to other uh, attributes because if I continue like this, I won't be able to finish this in half an hour more. Uh, the third, uh, the second attribute, in fact, third, including the uh, righteousness, is love and universal metaphysics. Well, in this modern era, whenever we speak about love, the only love that comes to our mind is the material love, love of a man and a woman. You know, and usually younger men and younger women. Let's see, you know, Romeo and Juliet love. Well, this is this is a materialistic reading uh, uh, of love. Love is actually the reason this whole universe was created. First of all, it was the divine love of our own, our Lord, to uh, towards His own names, His own attributes. Nothing existed, but our Lord wanted to see his own qualities through the eyes of others. That's the reason why we are created. Our Lord loves to be known. He ordained on us, Ma'rifatullah, the knowledge of God as a final target of perfection. But why? Because Ma'rifatullah, the knowledge of Lord, goes to Muhabbatullah, the love of our Lord. He wants to be loved, and he, of course he deserves to be loved. He is Rahim. In our own uh, Sufi understanding, uh, divine love, is the reason of existence and it is the reason of existence of the hereafter also although this is not a, a true hadith it's a beautiful saying if it was not for you if it was not for you i wouldn't create the universe this is um, a saying uh, of our Lord towards our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Our, our Prophet is, his name is about love. Ahmed, Muhammad, Mahmud, these are all uh, related to Hamd, Sana, uh, and uh, gratitude and love. And of course, mercy, compassion. These are all related feelings in the universe mm -hmm. and our response should be a love. Towards whom? Not only towards our Lord. Every Muslim has a duty to love God and to spread that love to the rest of the earth. That is a duty. Emri bil ma'ruf nahi anil munkar. Okay? Uh, ordering the, the, the good th tidings and good things and preventing people from doing bad things and so on. Yes, that is a duty. But also a love towards the rest of the humanity, a love towards the rest of the animal kingdom or plant kingdom, a love towards inanimate nouns all around the universe. Why? Because our Lord has created it. We love things that our beloved ones love. We fall in love with a girl and then whatever that girl loves, we say we love it also, and we learn how to love it. For this earthly, you know, temporary and usually meaningless love, we love other things only because our beloved one loves them. Well, our true beloved one is our Lord. And our true beloved lo loved one has a love, a mercy, a compassion towards the whole humanity, towards the whole existence. And that is 
And that has to be the source of our interest, our link uh, towards the rest of the society. And what you find this is, the person who equips and improves their heart with faith in God and knowledge of him, in proportion to that faith and knowledge, feels a profound affection and a vast love for all human beings, and in fact for all creation. And thus they live their whole life in the ebb and flow of an all-embracing love, being in a state of rapture and ecstasy, attraction, and the feeling of being attracted toward God and spiritual pleasures. Well, that is, that, that, that is the sublime Sufi expression of love. Living in a continuous uh, affection and a vast love for the rest of humanity, for the rest of the creation. Why? Because our Lord created them. Because the bond of perfect faith links us to them. You know, we, in, as, as normal human beings, we love our relatives. Why? Because our genealogies link each other. Okay. What is a genealogy compared to the genealogy of being created by the same God? That makes us brothers and sisters on this earth. That makes us brothers with the animals and the plants and so on on this world. And that gives us to do the, a duty of affection and uh, attraction towards the rest of the earth. That attraction is the source of a universal metaphysics. It says, Oje Fendi says, Blending their zeal, which overflows and embraces all times and places with the manners, styles, and methods of the contemporary age to reach the spirit of the Quran, which never ages, but surpasses all ages, and thus to reach a universal metaphysics will constitute our second step. Well, universal metaphysics is a kind of cosmology. Cosmology is the grand narrative of the universe, how the universe is created, where this universe is going to, what is going to happen in the end, and so on. This is the narrative of, uh, of cosmology. Our cosmology is based on love. Allah created the soul of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the first soul, because he loved him, because of love. And because of that love, he created the rest of the universe and so on. So love is not only the reason of creation of this universe, it is also the bond between everything in this universe. It is a bond between us as human beings. Do we keep such a love? Do we have such a strong attraction towards the rest of the humanity, towards the rest of the beings, existence? Uh, that is the question that we need to ask when we say, do we have the attributes of the inheritors of the earth? Let me pass to science. Well, this is not something new. And in fact, the, the, in, in Indonesia has always been uh, quite successful by means of Islamication of, or Islamization of science. Uh, two great names, one from United States, a Palestinian, actually, Ismail Raghi al Faruqi, and one from uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Sayyid al uh has actually done amazing work in the 20th century by means of Islamization of scientific knowledge. Oja uh, Fendi, of course, uh, uh, values that work. He refers to both intellectuals in his uh, writings and preachings, but he goes further. He says, it's not enough to bring the knowledge from the West to, the, to our uh, dominion. We have to also establish our own, own Islamic logic. We have to establish our own Islamic way of thinking, uh, establish our own, or if, if you wish, revive our Islamic consciousness. Because because of the historical experiences, particularly of colonization, but also 
because of the sense of backwardness uh, and so on, uh, we started to think uh, as if the West is the only benchmark of truth and so on. So our understanding of science it has become the Western science, as if the only the Western science is the correct way of doing science. On the other hand, Western intellectuals like Karl Popper, Fair Rabin, Thomas Kuhn, and so on, has been critical of their own understanding of science. In fact, Karl Popper said scientism is a, is a totalitarian ideology. It says Western scientism has been imposing up on us a single way of making science, whereas Art is another way of science making. Inspiration is another way of knowledge. And well, as Muslims, we should be open to other ways of uh, knowledge. First of all, we have the Quran, which was not revealed to us through scientific investigation, but it was revealed to us, to humanity, through our prophet, beloved prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through a revelation between the, the, the divine dominion and the, the human dominion. And we do believe that, well, the prophethood is sealed. There is no uh, chance another prophet will come. But revelation is not sealed. But of course, we do not receive a wahi revelation at the same level as the prophets, but we do receive inspiration, intuitions and so on. Even Western uh, philosophers who do not believe in God uh, or, or any kind of spiritual world, mm -hmm. they say that intuition is the first stage of innovation. And they do not know how intuitions do come to us. Well, intuitions mm -hmm. come to us as inspirations. Uh, and, and there is uh, uh, a divine uh, intervention over there. So we do believe that, yes, we need to study in order to attain sciences, but we need to pray also in order to attain sciences. We ask for knowledge from our Lord by both ways, by action and by prayers. Now, what Fendi says here, by means of scientific thinking and understanding, as we realized long ago, as we managed to do long ago, long before the West did, we must immerse and imbue our younger generations with science and ideas, and thus realize our revival, our renaissance. Which if he uses the term renaissance in a metaphorical meaning, we are not looking for a kind of renaissance that the West uh, had attained, because renaissance, uh, although the, 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 the term means revival in Latin, uh, it didn't, in their understanding, it revived the old Greek uh, philosophy. Well, we never missed the old Greek philosophy. In fact, when the Western societies uh, in the dark era of the Middle Ages forgot their uh, Greek wisdom, it was saved by Muslim intellectuals like Farabi, Ibn Sina, and so on. So, uh, Aristotle was always there, and in, in fact, in, among Muslim madrasa tradition, we are still studying Aristotelian logic, but it is no longer the uh, norm. We have to overcome the Greek logic also. Our renaissance, our revival, is not the revival of the Greek antiquity or Greek philosophy. It has to be the revival of our own true resources, scientific resources. Hoje Fendi also believes in eloquence. Well, what is eloquence? Belaga. Eloquence, eloquence refers to purity of speech, uh, you know, beautiful uh, ability to communicate ideas uh, and feelings strongly and so on. Hoje Fendi says, it's not enough to have good knowledge we also have to attain the ability to communicate that good knowledge to the rest of the earth. And he says, he believes 
that in the second half of the 21st century, we are going to leave not only a, an era of science, we are already in an era of science, we actually claim that we are a knowledge society or a communication society, but it is going to be era of rhetoric, era of eloquence, era of superior expression. That is a particular uh, invitation to Muslims all over the world to have their children learn languages. First of all, their own language. Many people think that, uh, well, with the advance of the artificial intelligence and so on, we no longer need, you know, the old communications because we, we, we will not need preachers. We will not need, you know, uh, public speakers and so on. On the contrary, on the contrary, within 20 to 30 years, robots are going to take over a majority of our bodily work and so on. And the future generations are going to deal with science only because of pure joy of science. And the debate clubs, demonstrations uh, of, of, you know, our, uh, logical demonstrations and, and so on are going to be major uh, hobbies of the humanity. And we have to get prepared for that. In fact, we do have the, the, the purest and perfect form of eloquence in our hands, the Quran. Uh, every other prophet has been given a kind of supreme sign uh, about their prophecy. And all those supreme signs are also signifying the utmost horizon of sciences. Like, for example, Sayyidina Isa revived dead bodies for a short time with the permission of our Lord, of course, but it also it, it suggests that there will come a time when medic medicine is going to be able to give a form of life after that, for a temporary period, to the body. Already we can see that even after that, we can communicate with the body, with some information is stored in the DNAs of human beings, that we can read it, and so on. Say, Sayyidina uh, Suleiman uh, showed us, uh, well, actually, transportation. Well, not a transportation by car, but uh, super transportation means like uh, TV. And of course, in the future, most probably we will attain better qualities on that. The supreme sign of our Prophet وسلم, was the eloquence, the rhetoric, the inimitability of the style or linguistic style of the Quran. And that also refers to a supreme, supreme perfection of humanity. And Ojeb says that is a target for every single Muslim to speak a language, at least one language, in such a way to be able to communicate their feelings, the most inner feelings. Sometimes we do speak languages as a second or a third language, and when we are trying to communicate a feeling, we feel ourselves, you know, lack of vocabulary. Well, that is a weakness. Particularly if you are lacking, searching for vocabulary in your own mother tongue, that is a weakness that we have to overcome. We have seen how diplomats, how public speakers uh, of the Western societies have actually led the humanity in the 20th century only because they speak good words. Sometimes they cheated the societies because they were good demagogues, well, successful demagogues. Muslims have to attain that power also, not demagogy, but uh, eloquence in speech. Let me continue on uh, critical mind. Hoja Fendi deals with this issue at length in several of his books and, and uh, preachings. Uh, 
In his understanding critical revision of our perspectives on universe, man, and life, refers actually to question once again some of our axioms about life, some of our axioms about, about our own religion even. Of course, there are muhkamat of religion, the open, uh, obvious truths that are given to us in the Quran. These cannot be questioned. There is no critical uh, revision of those facts. We cannot critically revise la ilaha illallah. No, there, is, there is no way of changing. This is muhkam. This is sealed information. We believe in it with no doubt in it. But there are parts of the Quran, Sharia, uh, that are flexible to the, to the new era. In fact, time is the best commentator of the Quran when it comes to the mutashabihat, the metaphorical terms in the Quran. They, te they, they say us something different at every different era. They told something to the first respondents of the Quran, the Sahaba, but they are telling us different things now. They tell something to a Sufi, they tell something else to an Orthodox Salafi who abhors Sufi understand. So that flexibility also puts on us the duty to question our own axioms of life from time to time. For example, we, we received in Islam, we received uh, a Greek uh, wisdom. This is a platonic, it comes from Plato, platonic wisdom that the universe hates emptiness. Hala'a. The universe does not like empty space. So whenever you, we usually use this uh, phrase uh, uh, in a metaphorical meaning, we say the universe does not like void or vacuum. Whenever you leave a power vacuum, somebody else is going to come and fill it. Yeah. Well, this is wisdom. This is wisdom. But it is not true. With the science of both uh, astrophysics uh, teach us that there are void in the universe and there are occasionally void in political science, uh, sociology, and so on. This was uh, a Pythagorean uh, original understanding of the flux of the humanity and so on, they believed that there was no void in the universe. There are voids in the universe. In fact, we know, we now know that there are anti-materials in the universe. That there are materials that exist as non-existence. Well, I'm not going to enter into uh, quantum physics and so on here, but we have to question our, our own understandings of even our science and, and religion. I'm going to move on to a few other uh, topics before I finish, because this particular one is very important in my understanding. Free thinking and freedom of thought. Well, when we say what freedom of thought, we understand what it is. Freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom of thought, and so on. It is actually guaranteed under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in fact, in Islam, we also believe in freedom of thought. Even uh, by means of faith, we say, La ikraha fiddin in the Quran, uh, our Lord said. There is no uh, imposition, there is no forceful uh, uh, positioning in uh, religion. You cannot force people to believe in God or you cannot even force people who do believe in God to do something or not to do something. Okay? The, the truth is obvious. To accept or not to accept is up to the person. That is the gist of uh, our, our test in this universe. It had, people has to be free. If they are not free, they shouldn't have uh, the duty to believe because we can just simply say, believe to them. Hoja Fendi here deals with another element of freedom of thought, free thinking. Hoja Fendi says, well, our thinking is not free. 
the colonization didn't colonize only our lands, it colonized our minds also. It taught us certain ways of thinking. First of all, as I said earlier, we started to believe that tr the truth, the benchmark of truth is the Western science or positive sciences. Whereas even the Westerns themselves are questioning the truth value of Western sciences. What we believed in the Newtonian physics was actually destroyed by Einstein. And what we believed in the relativistic physics of Einstein is already destroyed in 1990s uh, by uh, div a different understanding of the universe, quantum mechanics. And we don't know what, what next is going to come. Science, positive sciences are only theorems that await for a better theorem to disprove the previous one. It's not religion. They don't have a divine uh, support on the back of their theory theories. These are theories that will be disproved. Yes, each new coming theory can be a better theory compared to the previous one, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problems. It doesn't necessarily attain absolute truth value like la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah sallallahu this is absolute truth this is not a theory well our minds are colonized we cannot think islamically we do, in fact we don't know how to think islamically sometimes even our preachers and so on when we listen to them they use Greek logic. Well, this is not purely Islamic. Of course, uh, names like Ibn Sina and later on uh, major uh, logicians of Islam, uh, including Imam Ghazali and so on, they revived uh, the Greek logic within an Islamic garment and so on. But there are things missing there. And they belong to two and a half millennium ago. We have to, we, ha we had to already establish our own ways of thinking. Dear friends, my, my masters, artificial intelligence is entering into, into our world as a huge development. It is also a huge challenge to our sciences, to our ways of life, to our religions also. And that artificial intelligence is also conditioned on Western scientism, meaning it is already colonized. It is not innocent. It is not impartial. It is a Western artificial intelligence. We are not there. As long as we are not there, our minds are not going to be free. We are not going to be freely thinking. Some Muslims, you, you may find, call themselves social democrats. Meanings, meaning they, they refer to Marx, some kind of source of inspiration. You know, in Syria, in Egypt in the past, in Iraq, uh, regimes actually of Ba'ath party in Syria and in Iraq, they promoted a socialist Islam. On the other hand, you find other Muslims that, that come out and say, I'm a capitalist Muslim. These are all ideologies which has their dominion on how you think, how you attain a truth value. A Muslim has to have his own way of thinking. A Muslim has to free their thinking from the colonizing effects of Western scientism, Western ideologies, and I'm not saying only Western. Sometimes other shackles also bind our thinking style, like, well, desires, prejudices, and particularly in uh, Southeastern uh, Asian 
uh, hemisphere, uh, belief in uh, magic, black magic, and so on. Well, magic does exist, but several forms of it is un-Islamic. Well, it is totally forbidden, and uh, this witchcraft and so on, it should it should not have any place in a thinking style of Muslims. But we do have prejudices. Occidentalism is a shackle of Muslim thought. Political Islamism is also a shackle of Muslim world. You can be active in politics and so on, but you cannot uh, belittle Islam, trivialize Islam or your religion into a political ideology. Islam is not a political ideology. It does say a lot of things about politics, yes. A Muslim, a good Muslim can become a politician also, yes. A, po a good politician can be a good Muslim also. There is something else, but Islam cannot be diminished to the level of a political ideology. Our holy book, Quran, was not a political party manifesto. We cannot speak about a Mohammedan revolution as if we are speaking about a French revolution. Indeed, our prophet changed the human history in 23 years, more than 20,000 years of other human, uh, human endeavors, yes, but this is not a political revolution. It's not, it cannot be diminished to the level of politics. Why I'm saying that? Because our uh, sectarianism, Political ideologies, Islamic, so-called Islamic political ideologies uh, are also shackles on our minds. We, we have seen how violence promoting uh, so-called Islamic movements are putting shackles on their thoughts. We have seen the so-called Islamic state of Baghdad and Sham and so on uh, they have a very limited understanding of Islam, a very limited understanding of the world, and their mindsets are shackled. We have to free our thinking. Free thinking does not mean liberal thinking. It doesn't mean uh, you can think everything, you know. It means free your thinking from the shackles of colonial and Western, and also, uh, you know, Human weaknesses. Dear friends, I'm not going to read the rest of the, uh, the topics. I'm going to just pass through the names. Consultation, shura, or, and uh, establishment of a collective consciousness is very important. Hoj Effendi usually refers to Hajj, for example, uh, as a major gathering, intellectual gathering of Muslims. Let us ask a uh, question ourselves. Are we involved in any kind of intellectual activity when we go to Hajj? Do we really share information, share our uh, scientific successes uh, when we come together as Muslims? Well, this, uh, at this gathering, I did my best to share Hoj Efendi's vision uh, of the attributes of uh, the inheritors of the earth, but it doesn't always happen like that. Let us continue on. Mathematical thinking. Hoj Effendi gives very uh, much importance to this mathematical thinking. You can call it ge geometrical thinking also. It has its roots in uh, the uh, Greek antiquity, but it was perfected by the, uh, by the Muslim mathematic mathematicians. This is the Muslim way of proving and knowledge. And Oj Effendi, I'm going to read this. In order to comprehend existence completely, we have to adapt a dual method of Sufi thinking and scientific research. Mathematical thinking is not only about proving every information as, as, as Euclidean geometry does, which is a, uh, which is a, a very successful way of uh, demonstration of truth, but also uh, it uh, has to have a, a mystical element in it, a Sufi thinking. 
I suggest you to read uh, Bertrand Russell's Mysticism and Logic, which was which did influence Hoje Fendi's thinking. Also, Blaise pa Pascal's Geometrical Spirit, written in the 17th, late 17th century, is a great source of inspiration on how human mind should work. It has to have an inspiration element in it, but it has to uh, have a, a, an element of uh, proving and disproving our uh, thoughts. Particularly at an era of uh, artificial intelligence, we are going to need a mathematical thinking, train our children in mathematics and mathematical thinking. Mathematical thinking is not only knowing mathematics, being good mathematicians, it's about thinking how mathematicians do things. Well, Jeff Hendy dealt with aesthetics, which is usually missing in the Muslim world. Aesthetics is not art. Islamic arts are sublime arts, you know, in, from our uh, architecture to our uh, calligraphy to our music and so on. Nobody can say we are backward compared to the West and so on. In fact, Western artists are receiving inspiration from Islam. You know, the, the, the famous Picasso, the, the Cubist uh, painter, received his inspirations from both Africa and, uh, uh, and Islam. Abstract art was actually a Tunisian uh, gift. Well, Islamic arts are largely abstract arts and uh, we have managed to do amazing things. But the people in the streets do not live with an aesthetic thought. We, do, we have lost our daily life aesthetics. And daily life aesthetics is uh, the kind of uh, aesthetic thought. This is about how you organize your home, how you build your neighborhood, your garden, back garden, and so on, and how you behave to others, how you... Uh, select your garments and so on, how you shave yourself. These are daily life aesthetics that Muslims have uh, lost in the last several hundred years. Let me uh, finish the list. Chivalry, an interlinked between an action and thought, uh, joint action and thought. Hoja Fendi never says we have to uh, think only, he always invites action. In fact, action, uh, continuous action is the only solution to our problems. But of course, an action that is always criticized and perfected by deep thinking. But Jeff Hendy gives utmost importance to national culture. Not national culture of the Turks, national culture of every nation, every Muslim nation. You know? particularly in a globalized world where national cultures are being diminished uh, and in fact uh, uh, most of them are at the verge of being extinct. Jeff and this says we have to keep our identities, national identities strong. And the last one Jeff and this deals with the marriage of heart and mind. This phrase refers to a balance between reason and uh, and uh, spirit to a balance between body and the spirit to a balance between this world and the hereafter to a balance between religion and science to a balance between east and west and so on so uh, the attribute the, the inheritors of the earth are going to be people of balance between their inner aspects and outer aspects and so on.